let's get to present day. Now we're trying to send a message on the internet between Charlottesville and Berkeley. This is pretty similar to Cloud Chaps Network. It's not guys moving arms to send, but it's still going through routers. It's going through access points that are transferring the message along the way. How many hops do you think we need to get to California? How many transfer points are there? Is it less than 10? Less than 100? I think it's more than 100. Is it more than 1,000? Well, let's try and find out. We can actually see what they are. So we can run a trace route. Maybe I should try running a live one. Possible Berkeley moved since. OK, so we're going to run a trace route. What trace route is doing, I have a destination address, and I'm finding the routers along the way. So if I run a trace route, I'll see all the places that my packet is traveling between here and Berkeley. It looks like we're going through the first five of them are all still in the University of Virginia. They're all still virginia.edu addresses. Five seems not too unreasonable, right? It's got to go from my laptop here to some wireless access point. There's probably one in this room to some router that that's connected to, probably in Rice Hall, to some router that's connected somewhere else on grounds that's eventually connected to the big pipe to the rest of the internet. So that's taking five hops to get there. Then what do we think about these next four hops? Where do you think the packet is actually traveling the most? Yes. OK. Atlanta. Oh, OK. Yeah, that's good, yeah. The names look like they tell you where they are. So it's guess that that's Atlanta. I'm not positive that it is. Houston looks like it's almost certainly Houston. The other thing you can see about these is, is the time. So it took six milliseconds to get out of the university. Without any routers in between, it took 19 milliseconds round trip to get to what looks like Atlanta. That looks like it's taking an extra 13 milliseconds round trip, so it's about six milliseconds in the wire between here and Atlanta, which is probably a bit more than it should take if we'd have to figure out the distance to Atlanta and, and figure out light speed, but not too out of line with that. And then the next big one, going from Atlanta to Houston, that's taking another 20 or so milliseconds round trip, so 10 milliseconds for that distance. And that's getting pretty close to light speed for between the hops. And then there's time wasted in the routers. You can see the big hop here. Here's the question for you, looking at this now. This one says Houston. Do we think that router is actually in Houston? It's a name lying to us. Assuming we believe the ones that are berkeley.edu, our round trip time to Berkeley is 86 milliseconds. Do we believe that that router that's number 10, our hop number 10, that claims to be in Houston, is that in Houston? See a few people saying no. Why do you think it's not in Houston? Yeah. Ah, OK. So you looked up the IP address. They could be lying, too, though. You trust the, was it the Department of Education in California? You trust them more than you trust a router named Houston? I don't know. How do you really convince yourself that that couldn't be in, in Houston? That mapping that tells you where it thinks the IP is, that's some line in a database. There's no guarantee that that's correct. Assuming we trust the timings that we're getting from Traceroute, how do we know that's not in Houston? Yeah. Good, yeah. So it looks like if our routing times are correct, there's certainly some variance. It looks like it took 85 milliseconds to get to here, and it took a little less to get all the way to Berkeley. It's certainly not traveling the distance between Houston and Berkeley in what looks like less than a millisecond. It's at least a couple thousand kilometers between Houston and Berkeley. Either it's going faster than the speed of light, or that router is not in Houston. And I'm guessing it's not going faster than the speed of light. And probably the real name of that router, actually, if you look at it a little more, more closely, it could well be given that name because it's the router in California where packets coming from the router in Houston arrive. And they thought, oh, we'll call it Houston because it's coming from Houston. But it's definitely not located in Houston unless TraceRoute is either very broken or the speed of light is not what we think it is. And I'm fairly confident on the speed of light. Our overall timings, these are calculated from what I did from my house. So it took longer than 86 milliseconds here. It was taking about 100. The rate it was traveling over that distance, if it took 100 milliseconds, is actually faster on the test that we just did, was about 76,000 kilometers per second. Speed of light is real close to 300,000. We're wasting about 75 milliseconds. When it was 86, when we just tried it, we're wasting 
86 minus 25. So that's about 60 milliseconds. The 60 milliseconds that are wasted, that's pretty impressive that that's all it is, that we're getting pretty close to the speed of light in terms of the average speed our packets are traveling, despite having to go through all these local routers before they get out to that fast internet. What about your results for problem set three? The EC2 servers that you're running on for the benchmark are in Ashburn, about 110, 120 miles from Charlottesville. So we've got to do a round trip of about 350 kilometers between Charlottesville and the server, and the best response times were 6.8 milliseconds. The time it takes to do that round trip at the speed of light is a little over a millisecond. A lot of the time between the 1.1 that's just light speed and the 6.8 is the time going through those routers and times that you have no control over. So in terms of how close you can get to 1.1 milliseconds, unless you install a fiber optic cable directly between our benchmarking server and the EC2 servers in Ashburn, the actual time I would guess is probably like maybe four milliseconds, the fastest you could get a network packet there and back. So getting a response time down to 6.8, 7 milliseconds, you're getting pretty close to as well as you can do. Is it worth trying to get it faster than this if you're running a web server at least? Why not? Yeah, so a human's not going to notice. And if the human is further away, like if they're in California, well, we saw in California our, our run trip time's already 100 milliseconds, and it's at light speed, it's 25 milliseconds. So the amount that you're adding to that is a small fraction of the total time. It's not your server time that, that matters at that point for latency. In a reasonable sense, is as good as it's worth doing. What's not measured by this benchmark is if you had a million requests coming in at once, how that would affect this. And that's probably what a better benchmark would be caring about. We can do some other things with trace routes. Where do we think it's going to take the longest for our packets to go? And that's not necessarily the furthest place from Charlottesville. Does anyone know what the furthest place from Charlottesville is? Yeah. Yeah, so that lowest response is not necessarily the furthest geographically from us. According to Wolfram, the furthest geographically from us is here, which is in the middle of Pacific, so they don't actually have any web servers there. But it's only about 800 miles from Bustleton, Australia, which has a whole 15,000 people. So they actually have web servers. We can visit Bustleton, and we can do trace routes there. And it takes a lot longer than it takes to get to Berkeley. In terms of the, the optimal time, so this is my recorded result. So where is it traveling a big distance there? So we've got. It was taking 86 milliseconds round trip to get to this IP address and then 287 to get to here. So there's a 200 millisecond time between round trip, so 100 milliseconds travel time at close to the speed of light between those two routers. So where do you think those two routers are located? What would the endpoints be where we have 100 milliseconds between them? Yeah, something like that. Oh, you, you probably looked it up. You're very accurate. What can you guess from those? Yeah, it's going over some, under some ocean. If we're going to Bustleton, Australia, it's going across the Pacific. In this case, it is going from, well, according to this, it's going to Hong Kong, but it may have been Sydney that you saw. This is another one like what we talked about before. According to Info by IP, this address is in Hong Kong. It's definitely not in Hong Kong. It took only a few milliseconds to get from LA to that address. So you can't believe everything you read in info.ip or other places like that. It's probably owned by the same company that has the other endpoint of it, which I guess you were guessing that was Sydney from the SYD. That may be, and this definitely looks like Sydney, but that's enough further away. It could be another fairly long hop between Hong Kong and Sydney. Real geographic distances do matter. We don't think about them that much in designing computing systems, but they do matter, and this is why you pay different amounts to get EC2 nodes close to where your customers are, even if power and land and people are more expensive at those locations. How do we think traceroute is working? So we're running this program. We're seeing responses. Maybe I should do my traceroute. We'll see how Bustleton's doing today. How do you think traceroute is able to actually tell us this? So, so the DNS lookup is actually happening before all this. We're doing a DNS lookup on the bustleton.gov.au and getting this 203.41 address. Traceroute isn't doing anything with DNS other than getting the IP address to visit, and it's sending packets to that IP address. And there's no real reason the DNS tree has to be connected to the geography of where things are. The DNS hierarchy has top-level domains like .com that cover the whole US, so it's not geographically connected to where things are. DNS is certainly an important part of this, but not, in this case, the traceroute, we're starting to do timing after we've already done the DNS lookup. 
to understand more what Traceart is doing, we need to understand more what's going on in the network. People talk about the network having layers. The layers are really just abstractions to make it easier for humans to design network. Web requests are at that layer using this HTTP protocol. Once packets get transmitted, they're going through these other layers before they're actually sent. And what's happening on the wire depends on these lower level protocols that are at, the, at that layer. What's going on at the Mac layer? This is the bottom on, on this chart. We're saying we've gone from a web request through TCP, through IP, down to the Mac layer, which is what is going on below IP. Ethernet is on a local area network. That's the most commonly used Mac layer. This is how packets are encoded. On the Ethernet, we've got some header information. We've got a payload that can be up to 1,500 octets. That's using octet instead of byte, but it means eight bits. A little, little less ambiguity, calling it an octet. The overhead, if we're maximizing our payload to 1,500, is 37 octets of overhead that are necessary to direct that packet where it's supposed to go. So the overhead there is pretty low. Part of that overhead is this gap. We need a gap between packets so that the routers can keep track of which is which. And we need 96 bits. The time to send 96 bits at the rate of one gigabit per second is just a tenth of a millisecond. So that's the time that's wasted between packets. On the wide error network, it's even more efficient. So that's fairly inefficient, Ethernet. And there's a lot of complexity to Ethernet because you've got all these devices sharing the network in a fairly uncontrolled way. On the wide error network, it's mostly using PPP, which only has one or two bytes of overhead. What's more interesting is the IP layer. I'm showing you some pictures from a project a student did last year that looks at what's in the spec for IP and TCP over the years and how that's changed. This is how it changed between version 3.1 and version 4. So this was 1978, changing to version 4. There's quite a few changes here. It expanded the header by four bytes. The one that is most interesting is this time to live one. That's the one that's actually crucial for being able to do trace routes. It wasn't added to enable trace route. It was added to solve some other problem. And the problem it was added to solve is if you had a packet that had some flaw in it, or some flaw in the way routing is set up, you could have a packet that lives on the internet forever, back in IPv3. What would happen with a packet, it goes into a router. The router looks up the destination, and it sends it out to some other router. Unless your routers are all configured really carefully, there's no guarantee that it's not going to go through a loop. It's going to go through a bunch of routers, eventually get back to the original one, and they're going to keep sending around this loop forever. Part of the design of the internet is that it's easy to connect new things to it. You don't have any global configuration. So this is not that uncommon to have routing cycles. Such a packet would live forever. It would be a zombie packet. The way IPv4, which lasted for a long time, most of internet traffic is still IPv4 with slight variations from here. IPv6 is starting to be more widely adopted, but it's still not the majority of, of our internet traffic. What was added was this time to live field. And what the time to live field is is one byte that keeps track of how many hops a packet has been in. If that number gets down to zero, then you give up on this packet. That way, you know a packet's not going to live forever, because every time it goes through a router, you're reducing that time to live by one. So eventually, it's going to hit zero. And when it hits zero, the router doesn't continue trying to reach the destination. But it does send a message back to the source to say, your packet didn't make it. That's what's going on. So when the time to live hits zero, the router sends back a death notice. Instead of trying to reach the destination that was the original destination that's going back to the original source. What Traceroute is doing is taking advantage of this. It is sending out a stream of packets to the destination you asked for, and it's changing the time to live field. So if you send out the first packet and you set the time to live field of one, you're going to get a response from the first router because it's going to reduce it to zero and think that's a zombie packet and send a message back to you. And you can time, you can get the timestamps on those and, and learn how long it took. So that's all that TraceRoot is doing, is sending out packets, gradually increasing the time to live field to learn all the routers along the path. This is certainly not completely re reliable, because right? different packets can take different paths. Right? The fact that you sent you know, this one with time to live four, and then you send the next one with time to live five, doesn't mean it's going to take the same route through the first four hops. So that's why it's not necessarily giving you exactly the path that your particular packet would take on that, on that route, because they could all take different routes. But it's giving you a pretty good approximation of it. How efficient is IPv4? 
when we talk about efficiency of network protocol, we're trying to understand the data that we actually want to send is the payload, and then everything else is necessary just to get that where it is. The real data is, where is the real data? So this is all the header. We're not showing you the real data at all in this picture. This is the size of the header. If we're sending a kilobyte as the payload, well then we've got the size of the header, just 24 bytes, and then we're adding that to what we're sending. If we're sending big enough packets, it's pretty good. If we're sending a really small packet, if we only have 16 bytes to send, IP is really inefficient. Our header is taking up more than our actual payload. 